Hi, everyone. Glad you could join us. Uh, my name is Deb Wallace. Uh, for those of you whom I've not met before, I'm the Executive Director of Knowledge and Library Services uh, here at Harvard Business School. And I'm just delighted to welcome you to this Books at Baker uh, session with Mitch Weiss today. Thank you so much for joining us. I see a few familiar names, uh, in, or quite a few familiar names in the registration, uh, but there are many new people. And uh, so I doubly want to welcome all of you first timers. We'll um, make sure that you keep checking our website uh, for sessions, because we're going to have quite a number of sessions um, rolling out over the next couple of weeks. And I don't want you to miss out anything on anybody. So um, a couple of just a little bit about how our session is going to go today. Mitch and I are going to have a back and forth conversation about the book for, you know, 20, 25 minutes. Uh, and then we'll move to questions um, uh, from you. So you can put them in chat at any point or and we'll we'll monitor that. But let me first welcome Mitch uh, to the the stage. And uh, full disclosure, we have had a half an hour. Uh, we always do this tech check just at the beginning. And uh, um, of course, uh, we were like, Houston, we have a problem. So Zoom is uh, down in a number of sessions or other systems are down at school. Uh, and yet cool, calm and collect. Here's Mitch just ready to talk about we the possibilities, because we thought maybe he was going to be just talking about it all by himself. So, so we're delighted to have Mitch join us. Uh, and many of you know Mitch, he's a uh, professor of management practice here uh, at HBS in the uh, entrepreneurial management unit. Uh, he is also the Richard L. Menchin fellow at um, Menchel, sorry, I should get that right when we've got it. And I know Mr. Menchel, so my apologies. He's the Richard L. Menchel faculty fellow at HBS. And prior to uh, him joining us uh, at HBS in 2014, he's had a number of roles, but um, most recently then uh, was as the chief of staff to Mayor Menino and spearheaded um, the city government's uh, innovation strategy. I know we're gonna learn a lot about that. But what Mitch has done and uh, the book is the culmination of this, I think, is he's married his passion for public service and government uh, with entrepreneurial uh, studies. And uh, so what he's done is he's also created a number of courses, one in particular um, that is called Public Entrepreneurship that brings public leaders and entrepreneurs together. And this, this marriage of um, two great um, sets of capabilities is what has brought together this book. And now I have to put it really carefully so you can all see it and not get blurred. Um, we the possibilities. So it's just a fantastic uh, combination of two passions. I'm also struck Mitch with how timely this book is. Um, I was thinking last June, we had John Macomber here talking about healthy buildings just at the, you know, when the pandemic was really raging. We had Sadal Neely here uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago, a little over a month ago, uh, talking about remote revolution uh, and how uh, remote work is, is here to stay. And here you are at a point in time when the political environment is incredibly charged uh, to talk about the possibilities of government. So um, you're right in the thick of this conversation. We're just delighted um, that you could join us. Absolutely. So, yeah. Oh, so let me start with, I mean, best place to start the title. What do you mean by possibility government? Possibility government, um, the doing of uh, new and novel programs and services by government, by their partners, that by virtue of their newness and their novelty, Deb, will only possibly work, um, which means they probably won't work. Uh, and possibility government, therefore, is the realm of, of entrepreneurship. Uh, three quarters of new ventures fail. Those that succeed are transformative. And so when I talk about possibility government, I'm talking about the trying new novel things that might only possibly work. And um, I think it's helpful to contrast it with what we have most of the time, in fact, uh, which is not possibility government. Uh, what we have in most places, which is not possibility government but rather it's probability government, where we do things that'll sort of probably work, but they really uh, achieve sort of middling or mediocre outcomes. Mm -hmm. And we're, if we're being sort of clear-eyed about it, they're not really up to the task. 
So I th you, know, the, you, you also say that possibility go government isn't new, that it's been around, um, you know, we could push back this tug of war between possibility and probability, things that we're only going to put in place because we think they'll work, not because they could possibly work. But is this a mindset? Like, is this having this duality in structures? Um, are we missing a critical factor? Are we, do we not have the right structures in place? Is it, are we not agile enough? Are we not risk takers enough? We're not, at, we're not agile enough. Um, no, we're not, not in government, we're not. Um, the big question I have in the book, I raise in the book is can we solve public problems anymore? And uh, that is a timely question. And I come around to the answer, yes, if if we move towards possibility government, if we move towards trying these new and novel things, but no, we're not doing enough of that, uh, Deb, we're not. And uh, the reasons for that are many. Uh, one, um, one reason is by virtue of our existence, we're not that young anymore. Uh, when government was invented, uh, it was easier to, to, to be inventive. And then over time, uh, the bureaucracy gets put in place for good reasons, but set, gets settled in. Programs get layered on tops of programs. People. Uh, end up in jobs for a long while, and it gets harder to invent. And so the argument I'm making in the book, and I know it's an odd time to make this argument, but we have to get back to our inventive state. We do have to be more agile. We do have to take on riskier projects. Otherwise, we will not solve the big problems that face us. And when you're talking about government, we're talking about government at all levels. We're talking about city government. We're talking about all levels, all levels all around the world, uh, whether it's uh, in your local community, the your school system, the local transportation committee, whether it's the mayor of your city, a uh, president, a prime minister, uh, all around the world, we become uh, over time uh, too, um, too uh, fragile to change and surprise. And we're seeing that right now. And uh, while there are pockets actually, very uh, hopeful and inspiring pockets of inventiveness, also at every level, also around the world, I make the argument in the book and I believe it deeply that we need more possibility in more places if we're going to solve the problems that face us, all, all levels. So you, you've really spent the last six, seven years looking at successful possibilities, it sounds like to me. And, and I think the book- And, well, some, and some that weren't, that weren't. <laughs> that's the whole game. That's the whole, that's the whole thing here. Yeah. But I think in, in many ways, you, you look at what I would call an, from a, an appreciative uh, inquiry approach of what is working. So how you are definitely, I think I mentioned uh, in an earlier conversation, is you're not just a glass half full guy. You're a glass three quarters full guy, is that you really do believe in the possibility of, of government. And throughout the book, you do give lots of great stories uh, about where things are are really working. So I wanted to go to the book because I'm also always interested in the book as an artifact and how faculty come at pulling their, their research together. And you've used a really interesting frame, I think, which is, to me was the IDO frame of you imagine something, you try it, you you pivot or or perish it, and then you go to scale. You you just dive in. And so I'm wondering. Let's let's talk about each one of these um, playbooks and some of the the section in the, the stories that that you talk. And we can talk about them both from those that were successful or or what we learned um, from those that weren't quite so successful. So I think in the first one. You're talking about um, learning from the U.S. Special Operations Command. This is uh, James Gertz. And I was quite taken, of course, it, it, I believe it was the first um, uh, case in the book that, that you talked about. And here he is um, scrolling or trolling on um, YouTube to find innovations. And I, I, I went back to a James Bond vision of, you know, Q and James Bond talking about what, uh, what new gadget uh, he, Q had come up with uh, for James Bond to tackle his enemies. But so tell us a little bit more about James. First of all, why was he, why was he looking for ideas on YouTube to have US Special Operations Command think about new gadgets? I mean, that's the question I had in my mind when I when I met him. Actually, our, my colleague Dutch Leonard introduced me to him. So Gertz, Gertz, as you'll recall, was um, basically led a very large part, as you said, of the U.S. Special Operations Command. So these are uh, this is the the command under which our Navy SEALs, our Army Rangers, uh, other elite warfighters operate. And Gertz was in charge of getting them their equipment, basically. Uh, in some ways, I suppose he was their cue. 
And um, he was very worried actually that they had, that they had become uh, fragile uh, to surprise. And uh, it's shocking if you think about it because the US Department of Defense spends well over $600 billion of a, ye a year. They have uh, DARPA, the world's you know, most advanced thinkers on this working for them. They have all the private military establishment, the Boeing, the Raytheons inventing for them. So why on earth would Gertz, who's in charge of getting these folks technology, be looking for ideas on YouTube? You know, that, that, that seems strange. The world's most elite war fighters, really? And what he comes across on YouTube is this, this French uh, former, former jet skier on a flying hoverboard he invented. And he calls up Zapata, as you remember from the book, and says, you know, would you basically come to Florida? Could we see the hoverboard? And, and I was wondering, Deb, you're wondering why. I was wondering why. And that's why we, we go down to Tampa to try to understand yeah. um, how could this possibly be? And um, the answer, part of the answer is that, that so much of government, <clears throat> even in a place like, uh, like SOCOM, Special Operations Command, is focused on making choices. Yeah. And so little of it these days is focused on creating choices, making ideas. And Gertz, uh, YouTube is just one of a whole panoply of ways he's gotten into the idea of making business. And uh, he believes deeply that outsiders have ideas. He, be he believes deeply uh, that you can look actually to action for ideas. We don't actually know what the hoverboard's going to do or be for, but if we see it, then we might figure it out. This is complete, this is anathema. Most people will tell you, you must have a problem, then you go find the solution. And here he says, ah, it's a hoverboard, let's see what it does. We'll figure out if it can help us. So you can go to, um, you can go to uh, out, uh, outsiders for ideas, not experts for ideas. You can go to action for ideas. Uh, you can go to data for ideas. And uh, in government, we just aren't reaching out far enough. Uh, and Gertz is an example of somebody who, uh, who is. So tell us what happened to the hoverboard. Well, the hoverboard. So, um, uh, um, well, I, <laughs> he Not doesn't- Not much buy, really, right? He doesn't buy any hoverboards uh, uh, for, the, for Special Operations Command. And later, in fact, Zapata is flying over the, the Bastille Day Parade in France. And President Macron is tweeting, this is an example of an innovative French army and the French hadn't bought any. So you ask yourself, well, how innovative is this? If the, if the Americans and the French, none of them have bought these hoverboards. But the point isn't uh, about this particular hoverboard. The point is, did Gertz open up uh, SOCOM to people like Zapata? Yes. And Gertz tells me when I asked him, you have no hoverboards. He says, I got, I got Zapata in my Rolodex. I have him when I need him. And so it's, it's not about whether we um, necessarily buy every single one of these new ideas, whether every single one of these new ideas converts into something we pursue. Most of them will not. Most of them will not. It's about saying, look, having one or two or three ways of solving a problem is not nearly enough. I mean, look, just look at COVID. Last summer, how many ideas did we have for getting schools open? Two, three was open the windows, improve HVAC and maybe some tents for the kids. Why didn't we have a hundred? Look at vaccines right now. How many ideas did we really have going into October, November, December, January for getting vaccines in arms? Why is it just now the free beer, the lottery tickets, the new marketing? We need more ideas in so many places and the hoverboard was just um, an example of a, of a new idea. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and all these ideas started rolling in once government had put its stake in the sand. Is that, so once it's timing it too? It's, 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 it's an invitation once they open up. Gertz puts uh, this off base, he puts this place called Softworks. It's the skunk works of, a of the special operations. He says, come here, people, outsiders, techies, startups, high school students, high school students. I mean, high school students, he says, come here. So it's not so much about timing, but about the invitation. We have problems, you have solutions, come help us. And uh, that's what government needs to do more of it. Tell people, um, we, we want your ideas, even outsiders, those who are not expert, we want your ideas. That's what it takes. Yeah. So first we have to get a whole bunch of ideas. We have to keep them in the hopper some way. Maybe we create a pin interest account, right? And just uh, keep, uh, keep all of those for us to keep scrolling through. And then we have to test them. We have to try them out. And when you were talking about that, I, again, the, the one I think, because it's, you'll, you'll see most of my examples are like pent up travel. Like I just wanna start traveling again. And the, the story, the, the example that you used around test and try is Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. And um, what Nanette Shippers and her group, the innovation office. So she's actually in an innovation office, just like you were um, spearheading with Mayor Menino's group, it sounds like. So, and they were looking at the whole new sharing economy and Airbnb as a, a challenge. Uh, like how, how, was, how was this gonna roll out for Amsterdam? What did they try? How did they experiment? 
the main way they experimented was they allowed Airbnb ultimately to kind of unfold in Amsterdam, even as there were potential concerns about it. Mm -hmm. um, instead of shutting it down when people uh, began complaining about the noise uh, and the housing prices and et cetera. And so their allowance, uh, their tolerance was, was the first step to their experimentation. And uh, in Dutch, they have this phrase called hedogen. Uh, it means tolerance and it explains why, for example, um, you know, people used to, you know, you could smoke marijuana before it was legal, even yeah. prostitution. They, they it, it basically, they have a bunch of things in there that are basically illegal, but tolerated. Illegal, but tolerated. That's what Hadoken means. And they sort of took a Hadoken approach to Airbnb, which is it might not totally fit our housing regulations, but we're not going to super crack down on it right now. So tolerance was the first step. Then, then they did craft an MOU, Nanette did and her team with, uh, with Molly Turner, who led uh, partnerships at Airbnb. Uh, was their first employee to work really on civic partnerships there from their early days. And they crafted an MOU, a temporary memorandum of understanding, which basically said, look, let's take the next year. And uh, why don't you Airbnb work on some things that will help around uh, safety and, and information otherwise. And um, we'll see how things unfold. And then in the year, we'll, if we need to lay in more regulations, we will. And uh, it's very unusual, very unusual that the city would uh, show that kind of tolerance and then actually layer in a kind of um, build, measure, learn mentality. Let's, let's let this year be a prototype and see what happens. And I, I believe that this uh, approach, this Hadohan, uh, if you will, uh, has a lot of powerful lessons for us about trying, trying as other new technologies make their way into our cities and, uh, and otherwise. Now, right now, there's a real push to regulate the big tech. And um, uh, I think that actually is reason to do that. I'm not arguing against that. But the argument I make in the book is that we shouldn't punish the, um, the next generation coming up for the sins of the prior one. Mm -hmm. That we should allow actually the, the new, whatever the new Airbnbs are, or the new uh, technologies that are kind of, kind of show up in our, civic, uh, in our cities and, and, and show a little tolerance, let them unfold a little bit. I worry that if we squash them all at the beginning, yeah. before we try them, then we won't end up with the benefits of the ones that, are, that will end up being good. So what I liked about Annette's approach is first a tolerance, then an experimentation, then regulation, and um, and they have cracked down over time, and I and um, and so, anyways, I think that sequence is is quite powerful. Is and is there um, built in here, Mitch, um, sort of a, a bar for success too? Like, do we it, does government have to raise a bar to say, okay? you got to be at 90% before we're going to move. Like normally we'd say 50% and then we'll iterate and we'll constantly improve. And do, do, do. is it also um, trying and testing? Is there a timing um, section here? Ideally, ideally there should be, um, there should be uh, um, some measures put in place, a bar, if, yeah, Deb, to use your word for sure. Um, take the example of, of autonomous vehicles. As cities have decided whether or not to allow autonomous taxis and other autonomous vehicles mm -hmm. to roam their streets, I had the occasion to watch this unfold in Pittsburgh under Mayor Bill Peruto there, and he gave he gave the early uh, Uber taxis basically you know free reign on Pittsburgh streets. Other other cities took a more graduated approach in Boston. After I had left, so I take no credit for this. Uh, the team there worked with autonomous vehicle companies to uh, permit their roaming Boston city streets as they uh, cross certain bars. Deb, yes, as they reach certain thresholds. After you've driven a certain miles at all miles safely, miles in the dark, then we'll let, I mean, in the light, then we'll let you drive in the dark. After you've driven a certain amount of miles here in this relatively um, unpopulated area, we'll let you drive elsewhere. I think this model of graduated uh, uh, permitting, if, if you will, also holds power as these new technologies make their way into our, into our cities and other places. What, what if, precisely as you describe, we allow you uh, larger and larger areas to operate in, more and more freedoms to operate in, if you meet certain certain um, expectations. And what if we did that instead of either squashing these things in their very nascency or giving them complete free reign where bad things happen? I, I think a graduated approach uh, may well be called for in many places. Yeah, yeah. And then that third component uh, of going to scale, because what we're saying is, you know, the, the challenges and opportunities that are facing all levels of government are not tiny. I mean, these are not small, discrete little projects that we can tie a bow on and, you know, say one and done. Is that these are, they have in, incredible reach. They've got 
uh, a lot of different complexities. And so when we go to scale, you were, I, I think it's in chapter five, you were talking about going to a meeting uh, with Waze and you were having a heck of a time getting there on time because the traffic was so um, challenging. So how, did, how is Waze um, opening this up for scale um, with this incredible, what I would call entrepreneurial optimism or possibilities? Well, for Waze, yeah, it was, it was kind of certainly ironic being stuck in traffic trying to get to a meeting at, uh, at Waze, but what I learned at Waze was two really powerful, um, two really powerful lessons about scale and about what this all might take. One was the ambition for scale. So I go to Waze to ask basically <clears throat> their leadership about a program they had built uh, called the Connect and Citizens Program to ex exchange uh, data with cities. And they had been at first in 10 cities, then in 50 cities. And so I said, you know, in two years, uh, you know, how many cities are you going to be in? And the COO at the time says to me, how many cities won't we be? In? Like, you know, why, you know, you look at you, you little Harvard. It's optimistic. Yeah, I think it was small. It was, it was, it was optimistic. It was, it was, it was ambitious. It was ambitious yeah. that and on uh, Nandani Lakani, who who uh, championed the um, the Adahar project in India and, and since more uh, programs around uh, government as a platform uh, 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 uses the, the phrase population scale. You know, how do we think of population scale? So yeah. Um, so first, so the ways, the first thing is this ambition for scale. And then, then it's the methodology. How do you get to every city in the world? Or how do you uh, uh, have ways uh, reach as many uh, drivers as it is? Or how do, in general, um, programs reach everybody on the planet? And the answer I, uh, um, I learn over time and describe uh, in more detail in the book is, is basically government as a platform. Tim O'Reilly had coined this yeah. phrase, mm -hmm. government as a platform. Um, I take it to mean harnessing essentially platform thinking. How does, how does government either connect people so they can exchange things, data, um, I, uh, especially data, money, other things, goods, or so they can innovate? Mm -hmm. How does government lay the platform, the foundation, the architecture, the software, the hardware, the rules, the process, so that other people can exchange? And importantly, so there are positive network effects, which is to say, so that everybody makes other people better off. The key I learned studying Waze, uh, because also Waze was on roads, roads were some of the original platforms, uh, is, is building programs and services where government doesn't have to provide the direct service, but they lay the foundation so that everybody who joins makes other people better off. And that was a really, really uh, powerful lesson for me. And now I, I can see Tim O'Reilly uh, Tim O'Reilly had said, um, you know, uh, you can apply government as a platform in every aspect of government. And man, I don't know about every, uh, but, um, uh, Tim, but I think you can certainly apply it in lots. Yeah. Huh. Well, and the other thing that when I was reading your book, I was struck with some of Mike Tushman's uh, work here at HBS about the ambidextrous organization. And when he was talking about innovating for success, is that you, you instead of keeping your innovative group just integrated in the organization, you pull it out and you let it operate on its own. And then as it tests, et cetera, and, and goes to scale, then you integrate it back into the operation of the, of the organization. It sounds like you followed that um, model uh, when, you, when you were working with, uh, with the mayor's um, innovation group. So I'm also wondering, like, is, do we have to, is this a successful structure? How, how well has that been sustained? The same thing we saw with um, Amsterdam having a group of innovation. Is having an innovation group working for many layers of government or where, what's your thinking on that? So I didn't know about ambidextrous uh, leadership or ambidextrous organizations okay. when we started the mayor's office of New Urban Mechanics, but I certainly came to uh, afterwards and, and certainly saw Mike's uh, advice in, in all of that. Um, and I do believe, Deb, that if we are going to have possibility government, we need to have ambidextrous government. In other words, we absolutely need parts of government that are supremely focused on exploiting the present, doing good at what we're doing. Um, and we also need parts that are good at exploring the future, at probing the future, at trying new things. And we need leaders at the top who can, who can supervise both. I, the, the, the metaphor I like to use is, is you need to be the kind of public leader who at nine o'clock can have a meeting about the, you know, the KPIs, the key performance indicators around trash pickup. Yeah. And at 930 can have a meeting about, are the drones getting the trash on? You know, is that, is that where we're headed? You need to have leaders at the top who can hold both those ideas in their mind at the same time. This is the first criteria uh, Mike and his, his co-authors uh, lay out. A leader at the top who can be ambidextrous. And then 
you do need to design the organization. So there is a part that it's the explorer function and there's a part for the exploit function. By the way, I tell all these innovators in government, you know who you need to thank every single day for the permission to do what you're doing? The rest of uh, your colleagues in government who are just doing the stuff we've been doing before because their success, again, the trash picked up, yeah, right. gives you the permission to explore uh, the drone store trash because I promise you, some mayor or some governor who's only on the future bent uh, won't be there for very long. <laughs> You need to be able to have both. We need ambidextrous uh, government for certain. And I've seen that. We did that in Boston. We didn't know that's what it was called at the time. Uh, we've seen it uh, now instituted in other places. And I think it's a, uh, I think it's a really good strategy. Yeah. But, you know, you've made a, a point that I'd, I'd like to dig into a little bit more is about the voters and being in government, you're, you're there at the, at the will of the people. And if you're not meeting the people's needs, like how how will our officials stay in um, in in their roles if they the probability government where you need to make sure you're moving things forward? And if you're having a 75% failure rate on your possibilities, how, how do you stay elected? Well. Part of it goes to what I just said, which is you need to have both going on so that I your see. whole government isn't at a 75% failure rate. That would be terrible. Yeah, I guess. So, but, note to self. <laughs> note to self, yeah. But the other thing is, the other thing is we need to bring the public along uh, with, uh, with, um, um, on the possibility project, Deb. We cannot move to possibility unless we move together. We can't get to possibility government unless, unless the public gives uh, their, their elected officials, by the way, their neighbors, um, the, the, the permission to try new things, the encouragement to try new things, their co-participation. So um, we need public leaders for sure who are going to be braver, uh, um, uh, although to be honest, uh, and more skilled. And um, although to be honest, if they had the skills of possibility, they wouldn't even need to be that brave. Right. They can try new things without taking on too much risk. But we need public leaders who are willing to do this. At the same time, they need to be uh, candid with the public about what's it going to take. I admire the public leaders who are willing to stand up and say, uh, this might not work. I, I write about in the book, um, Melvin Carter, the, the mayor of St. Paul, who an announces a series of public safety uh, pilots, experiments, new and novel things to try to make public safety more effective in St. Paul, to try to make it more equal, uh, to try to put it in the hands of the community. And he says, he says on this fraught of fraught topics, uh, not everything we try is going to work the first time. I, I think public leaders need to have that kind of candor. They need to be honest with the public about what solving problems anymore takes. And if they do that, I believe um, that the public will come along with them. So it's a layer of transparency. Of yes. Talking transparency. About it. yes, and candor, and candor. Yeah. I mean, when, when public officials say time and time again, this new thing is going to work, they're wrong about it. And they're, they're lying, um, even if they don't mean to be. And when we believe them, we're lying to ourselves. So it's important that they say, we're going to try um, a lot of new things to, uh, to, to solve these problems, housing, security, affordability, public health. Not everything's going to work. Yeah. And it's important for the public to uh, then hold them accountable. If you're lazy, if you're corrupt, if you're inept, then throw them out of office. But if they try new things, they don't waste too much time, don't waste too much money, and they produce a lot of learning, then they're doing their job. Yeah. Well, you know, it also, I'm thinking as we're talking here, you've written this book for quite a number of different audiences. You've, you've written it for the politicians, you've written it for the civil service or the people who are the administration around that. You've written it for the citizenry, the people, she can't even announce or pronounce that way, for, for everybody who's voting. And you've also written it for entrepreneurs. Yes. Have you not? So how... Have you had reactions from these different groups about what they've taken away from the book or what they've seen in it as possibilities for themselves? Or, you know, I'm not, maybe not all four of these segments, but entrepreneurs in particular, what, what do they think about it? Well, the entrepreneurs are um, ex excited about this, that, that they can actually combine their skills in entrepreneurship uh, and solve the big prob public problems that face us, that they can actually access what turn out to be the largest customers in the world, um, that they can use some of these methods to do it better. Right. I talk about in the book that, you know, government's, <laughs> government selling is government buying. If you can understand how government buys, well, you can actually get your new novel products and services into their hands. And so there has been a, uh, uh, a large wave of entrepreneurship into this space. I joke, Deb, if you walk into any city hall and look at the 
the old sign that's there that's the office directory here's voting here's uh, elderly services here's veterans here's transportation there is a technology company a startup building for every single one of those services today and there will be more and there are venture capitalists backing them there are venture capitalists backing them we just had i remember one week this spring two of our alum uh who who founded uh uh, Brandon Sang, who co-founded Shield AI, uh, Michael Martin, who co-founded Rapid SOS, both raised their Series C rounds uh, within a couple of days of each other. Uh, giant rounds uh, to support their growing companies, to to support uh, in, in in Shield AI's case, uh, defense and security, and in Rapid SOS's case, um, emergency response. And there are many uh, dozens of other uh, companies like them. And now, and the venture capitalists um, backing them. There was just another announcement yesterday. General Catalyst is uh, it's starting a, a essentially a civic a civic tech vertical. So. There's been a lot of enthusiasm, Deb, in this space by entrepreneurs and by the investors who who uh, who invest in them and help them. Yeah. Well, you know, I have a list of questions. I could just keep going and going, but I do want to make sure that um, we have our uh, leave time for our participants to ask questions too. And I see there's a, a number of them that have come into the the chat. Um, let me. Uh, let's see. Let's. I'm also my systems are down a little bit here, but I've got it here. So um, the, the first question is talking going back to Michael Porter's work um, a number of years ago, uh, the alumni survey on competitiveness, as is what Jan Ripken worked on as well. The data found that the US has weak and eroding competitiveness, competitiveness in our K-12 education system, healthcare system, and our political system. How do we reverse these trends to make them more competitive? Sounds like you just need to hand out a copy of your book to all these. A book to everybody in all sectors. Um, uh, we need to be more inventive um, uh, across all those fronts, education, healthcare, democracy itself. We need to be more inventive uh, for certain. I, I write in the book, you know, we get the government, we invent. And, um, and, and we need to be more inventive on all these fronts. And people say, well, oh, wait a second, not healthcare, where people could get hurt, not schooling, where if, 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 if we're not doing well, then a student loses their first grade year, they can never get it back. Yeah. And I invite people to, to notice, um, you, you talk about the new thing being risky, but in many instances, the status quo is the risky choice. These first graders uh, who may not be learning right now, uh, this health system, which isn't prepared for a pandemic, uh, wasn't right, right then. And so we need to become inventive across all these sectors, including, um, to the questioner here, our political system, including our democracy. You could say, oh, please, please, don't take possibility to our democracy. That's the thing that's most fragile. Why would you why would you try things there? Entrepreneurship for that? And I say with the proper guardrails, yes, yes, because it is the most fragile because it needs um, uh, uh, to be refurbished. And uh, we need to do that. I mean, I think of an example, um, a friend of mine started an organization called Protect Democracy, uh, where mostly what they do is litigate and, and otherwise to protect, uh, to protect our, our democracy. But they also started a, a piece of it. I write about in the book called Vote Shield where what they're use, doing is using machine learning to detect aberrations in voter registration lists, to, to, to make sure that some hacker didn't get in and change people's addresses from 100 Main Street to 10 Main Street, or somebody else who wanted to maybe disenfranchise a certain population didn't get in. It'd be the easiest way, they say, to corrupt an election. So I'm thrilled he invented Vote Shield, and, I'm, and, and on balance, I'm, I'm glad that we have people inventing for our political system, our democratic system as well. So on all these fronts, I, I believe inventiveness is uh, is called for, even though it can seem fraught. Yeah, yeah. There's another question um, that relates to DARPA, and um, James writes. Um, he's reminded that 10 years ago, when Regina Dugan was DARPA director, they started the Cyber Fast Track program to elicit and quickly fund small-scale cybersecurity projects from researchers outside of the agency. The program lasted only a couple of years, but it sounded like just the sort of thing you're talking about. Is that, Are you aware of that, DARPA? Um, I, I don't know the Cyber Fast Track program, um, okay. but, um, but, I, but I, I know this, that for the last um, many, many decades, uh, you know, but certainly uh, before 9-11 and since, uh, so many pieces of our security apparatus, whether it is the Defense Department uh, with DARPA and otherwise, whether it was the CIA, um, have been trying to become more inventive. Um, almost every Secretary of Defense has at some point made a pilgrimage out to Silicon Valley oh, right. uh, and try to figure out how we would become more inventive. Uh, there has been progress on this front. So uh, Ash Carter, Secretary of Defense, now back at the Kennedy School, uh, led the charge behind creating the DIU, the Defense Innovation Units. 
uh, Softworks, we talked about it at SOCOM. There's now AFWorks um, uh, for the Air Force and, and many other uh, there, uh, pieces of the, of the apparatus to try to help the place become more inventive. And, um, and it's because, our, because you can be for certain, I think the questioner, I think James is, is getting at it with the cyber risk, that our adversaries are more inventive. Yeah. And so uh, we, have to, we have to be more nimble, more agile and catch up. And that's why you see in so many, on so many fronts, uh, the defense apparatus, the security apparatus trying to become uh, more nimble for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, Lionel also asked about um, some more examples of in, inventive uh, projects that you've, you could highlight that were tried out and hopefully successful. Was there another one in the book that that well, I'll, I'll, I'll share with Lionel a um, controversial one, um, but one I got to see, um, uh, um, you know, at, at, at the height of its uh, utility, which was in Singapore, uh, uh, as COVID uh, unfolded there, mm -hmm. and the efforts by GovTech Singapore, which is their digital transformation agency, part of their government, to respond to COVID in, in new ways, um, and to build ultimately what became called Trace Together which was their uh, Bluetooth-based contact tracing app. So in Singapore, uh, Lionel, in Singapore, when COVID uh, was detected at the end of January la last year, Singapore unfurls all the probability parts of their government, the things they've done before uh, that they learned in MERS and SARS, the human-led contact tracing, the isolation and quarantine, and they should have. And those things helped. They, they were absolutely essential. At the same time, uh, a gentleman I've gotten to know, Jason Bay, who runs digital services for Singapore, um, uh, says, I, I had this vague recollection of a sophomore in high school in the US who during Ebola had this idea for Bluetooth-based contact tracing. And, um, and uh, pulls over actually when he has this, uh, I recalls this to the side of the road, texts his friend at the Ministry of Health and says, have you heard of this? Are you trying it? Might it be helpful? And uh, no, we're not trying it. Yes, it might be helpful. And so Bay and his team, through a series of, of beta uh, sort of uh, bill measure learn cycles, Mm -hmm. uh, build out trace together. First, they just take the phones they have on the office. Can they detect each other? Then in, inside their backpacks, then off, uh, off site to an army base, getting people to move around. These, these ever increasing um, sort of modest experiments until ultimately it's ready to invite the Singapore people to download and to use. Now, it's controversial. Um, uh, uh, there are aspects of Singapore's response that, that we wouldn't mimic here in the United States. But in a country of, of 5.7 million people, Lionel, uh, how many people died of COVID? Last time I checked last week, it was 31. Yeah, I was gonna say under 50. Yeah. Under 50. So, um, and, and, and Trace Together and all the other new ideas that Jason and the team put uh, uh, out there, he will be the first to tell you are not the reason for that. They're a part of a response mm -hmm. that where there were dozens of new ideas tried and scaled in order to uh, make things work. And so, it was fascinating to watch, uh, both because they were given so much permission to try new things, so many resources to try new things, also because of the fraud issues around privacy and otherwise. Uh, but that, to me, that's a, a striking, a striking example of a possibility government and possibility government working, uh, working hand in hand. Yeah, you know, Mitch, when you when you were working on the book, I know you've written um, a lot of cases uh, for your your new course and for the uh, the work that you're doing with entrepreneurial um, the ultra entrepreneurial manager as well is when how how successful are you at the cold call um to a government agency saying could you tell me about what's working and not working or are are your i think you mentioned before the dutch um leonard and other faculty here introduced you how how do you get in to talk to these people in government um and and how how open are they with you um there, to me, that might be a bit of a challenge. They're surprisingly open. Yeah, you think it'd be a challenge because why do they want this Harvard Business School professor following something that's probably not gonna work, right? Yeah. Um, so the thing is, when I explain to them what I am trying to accomplish, which is help support a movement for more inventive government, uh, therefore for better problem solving, they're on board for that. I mean, that's they're on board for that. That's what so many of the people I'm reaching out to want to engender as well. They see that uh, they can't do it alone. They see that the ultimately the environment for a possibility uh, needs to change. They want to be part of a movement, and so um, they're um, they're they're all they're oftentimes. I mean, I can't actually think of a time when I've been turned down. There was one time I wrote a I wrote a case on the U.S. Digital Service, 
So the U.S. Digital Service was uh, was started under Obama, an effort to actually make sure something like healthcare.gov never, never, ever, never happened again. Yeah. To bring in people from the outside who had a possibility skill set, to bring outsiders, uh, insiders rather, out from the woodwork, to have them work together and really make sure we raised our, our game here. And I wrote a case uh, with a colleague of the Kennedy School, Nick Sani, on the U.S. Digital Service, and we, we were racing to get approval for it. Uh, they were very excited to have us write it, the, the protagonists, the co-leaders of the U.S. Digital Service, uh, Todd Park, others. Um, but uh, then Obama was retiring, and we had to get it approved before, um, before the new president. And I'll tell you, Deb, that I'm, I had to call on a favor from uh, my colleague who you know well, Karen Mills. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we got it. I believe we got the case uh, signed off on the day before uh, Obama left office. So, um, uh, so I've never had a problem getting in. Uh, and I don't anticipate it. People want to be part of this, want to be part of this movement. Yeah. So they do want to open the doors and, and talk about the, the possibilities. Yes. Yes. I mean, I, I went all the way to the Republic of Georgia to write a case about um, them using the blockchain to uh, try to protect their property rights against the Russians. And uh, I went there and met with the Minister of Justice there. She's a, she was a fascinating woman. And she wasn't sure what all this blockchain was at the beginning. She wasn't sure whether it was going to work, but she recognized that, um, that, that, that government needed to uh, be um, her, uh, more responsive than it was, more innovative than it was. She wanted her agencies to move into the future. And she wanted to be part of it. And she was, she was more than willing. You'd think the Minister of Justice of Georgia, the Georgians, the Russians, this thing seems super fraught. And yet she was, uh, again, willing to let us tell the story uh, because uh, it's important that we learn the skills of, of, of public entrepreneurship and possibility government. Right, right. There's, there's a question about entrepreneurs believing in themselves and people believing in the possibilities of entrepreneurs. And it's, uh, so what, what can a public entrepreneur do if he has the brightest idea at an urgent time, but people just aren't willing to embrace it? Like how, how persistent do, do our possibility people need to be? Well, persistent, um, but also um, it's not just about persistence. It's about trying to actually get to building earlier uh, in ways that will actually allay people's fears. So when I coach public leaders, um, and they're running into the kind of resistance the questioner is asking about here. I say, look, you really do need to anticipate that they're they're very they're they're nervous. The people in your agency for a number of reasons, um, or they don't believe change is going to happen for a number of reasons. So first of all, um, they have this one thought rolling around in their head, which is that change doesn't happen. I've heard this before. Some whippersnapper came in. You know, it didn't happen. I we'll just wait you out. So number one, they think change doesn't happen. Number two, they think that change isn't allowed. It's against the policy okay. or, or against the, you know, the rules or the law. You know, I remember there's a story of one of the uh, earlier uh, long ago governors in Massachusetts who used to walk around with the constitution in his pocket and when people said this wasn't allowed. He'd pull it out and say, really? It doesn't say that here. <laughs> um, so, but they think it's not allowed. And then they think um, it's gonna hurt them. There goes their overtime or their sense of self-worth or their, or their, 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 their uh, promotional um, you know, possibilities. And so what I tell public leaders is you can't talk your way out of those real um, and in many cases warranted anxieties. You have to actually make your way. And the way you do that is by getting started earlier on one of these projects in a beta sort of fashion. And people will see, they'll see, oh, change did happen. They'll see no one got dragged in front of a you know, hearing room or got skewered in the press. They'll see that they're still here. They feel um, rewarded, satisfied. And so I think it's not just, you don't want to just tell people again and again, and again, we have this idea, we have this idea, we have this idea. You need to find a way, and I describe the methods in the book for uh, uh, getting them to try it. And that will help build the positive cycle that you need. And what about resources? We've got a question here about, you know, governments have limited, well, some government layers have limited resources. Other government layers seem to have unlimited resources. But when we have limited resources, how do we think about scale and trying ideas that may not work. And so how can we be um, uh, good stewards of the government coffers too at this time? Well, it's a great question. It's because you're gonna to need to be if you're gonna sustain the public's willingness on this front. Um, I would say a couple of things. First of all, first of all, when we try these new things, we should try them in modest ways. Again, that don't waste too much time and don't waste too much money. 
Uh, secondly, we should adopt the logic, I argue, um, not all the behaviors, but the logic of, of venture capital, if you will, which is that we invest in the things that's, that appear to be working. And after giving a, the th things a real chance, if they're not working, we, we, did, we don't invest behind them. So we scale the things that are working and we don't scale the things that aren't. That's the logic of right. venture capital. A few right. big wins cover for a bunch of small losses. That's the mentality we should have. We don't have. In fact, our, our public procurement systems are, and our budgeting systems are not set up to invest in programs in these, in these ways. Instead, what happens is we have all these pilot programs that sort of just linger around whether they're working or not. They don't get more money. They don't get less. So we need to, we need to address that. And then we do need to be clear. We do need to be clear. This goes back to my point about the status quo often being a dangerous uh, choice that buying things the way we do mm -hmm. isn't inherently cheaper. Uh, because what happens is we spend four or five years, 100 paid contracts. Eventually, these technologies show up. These programs get built. They're, they're not responsive to the problem they were originally designed for. They've received no input from the public along the way. And we end up wasting millions or billions. And so I think it's a, it's a great question. But I think it's important that we point out sometimes the false dichotomy that somehow the new thing's going to be more expensive than the old way of doing things. I think the old way of doing things in terms of inefficiency, waste, and delay is pretty expensive itself. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to and hard to quantify that impact over time. Yes, so there's another question about um, innovation across the organization, like what we we're talking before. Uh, Mike Tushman's idea about the ambidextrous organization. When you pull things out into a separate group, are they considered to be the only ones who can be innovative, or how do we have this innovation, the possibility going across the organization? So you don't just have the the explorers, the people who get to do all the cool things, and then the rest of us, you know, are just doing our, our day job. Right. Well, that's a great question. And it's, it's not ending riddle. I, there aren't a lot of organizations that have mastered this. Um, but um, so what, what Tushman would say is that, first of all, the leader at the top needs to set a common goal, common goal for everybody. So everybody, whether they're, they're explorers or the exploiters, they're, whether they're the future folks or the present folks feel like they're part of the same mission. Sure. sure. That's really important. Secondly, um, you do need to keep the separation. You do. Um, but you also need to build up some connections in terms of relationships, assets. And I think in the public setting, these relationships turn out to be really key. Yeah. You need to have people who don't act like they're special, who don't stay hived off, who do wind their way into the other parts of the organization. In, in, in Boston, when we started the mayor's office of New Urban Mechanics, Chris Osgood and Nigel Jacob were just two of these kinds of humans. Um, uh, wonderful, self, uh, selfless, uh, helpful, generous humans. So it's really important when you stand up these organizations in, uh, in a government, you don't populate them full of people who, who act like they're special or think they're special. Um, you do need to keep them separate for a time being, uh, but you don't, uh, you don't need to have them you know, uh, be jerks about it and to be blunt about it. And then over time, you build the connections back up. So at Softworks, just to go back to as a great example, starts off very, very separate, off base, None of the same money, a few, only you know, not really any of the same people. Over time, they build up more more connections. The money starts flowing, the problem sets start flowing over time, but not at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. And I think related, um, the next question is about around bureaucracy and that where people rarely accept positive change, how do you approach facilitating that transition? So what if you are the person within the governmental group or the, the, the department that you want to try new things and you just can't get that impetus? How, what, what if it's bottom up as opposed to top down? How do we have bottom up innovation? Yeah. Again, there. I think it's. Um, I think it's about trying to get this um, work going. Like, I don't think it's really about talking your way to innovation. You know, yeah. telling your bosses we need to do this and trying to get some you know three year innovation plan. I think at the beginning, it's just put it into practice. Uh, take some existing workflow you're doing that seems kind of uh, uh, like it's operating in maybe the more traditional sense. It's going to be. Uh, lots of pre-planning, lots of consultants, lots of commissions, and see whether instead you can build, measure, learn your way through the early parts of it, and then see if people um, align to that kind of approach. I, I, uh, I don't want to underestimate how hard it is, though. Yeah. I mean, um, I mean, government. I wish, I wish, I wish, 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 wish that people in government weren't more risk averse than everybody else. But the economists have studied it, and they are. So uh, it's hard in these organizations yeah. to to get people who aren't ready to do this. But I think if you, if you, if you, get, if you start down the road, 
and you make some progress. My experience is, and my what I've witnessed around the world is people who are at first skeptical start to become excited about it, want to join up. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the other thing that that struck me of, um, about while I was reading your book, Mitch, is this is a very personal book, and I love how you put yourself out there. I, I can't again fairly early on. I thought, okay, this is really interesting. Here's a, how, were, how old were you, nine, when you wanted to dress up for Halloween as a voting booth? I I, I'll just tell you this, Deb, without, I was older than nine. <laughs> oh, were you older than nine? <laughs> I had you at nine and I was trying to think, okay, how, how would a third or fourth grader dress up like a, a voting booth? So tell me what, first of all, I have to know, what did that look like? Do you have a picture? I, I have to see this picture. We're trying to track down the picture. A friend of mine thinks he might have the picture in his attic. Uh, but trying to track down the picture, but but I was yes, I was interested in public stuff. Uh, yes, since I was a little kid for sure, and 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 dressing as a voting booth from Halloween was just part of that. But so as I said, it's it's a very personal book. You, it's very conversational. What are you hoping this book will do? What do you see its possibilities as? And what? So let's let me start there. What do you think the possibilities are? Well, I, I want to change the way the government works all around the world. I want governments to, to, to be better at problem solving so they can raise uh, living standards um, and, you know, and, uh, all around the world. And um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not so um, egotistical to think that I will do that on my own, but I, I think I can contribute a slice. Uh, I desperately want to do that. Yeah. And part of that, this goes to the little kid in the voting booth, part of that is inspiring uh, a next generation of people to combine their skill set, their interest in, in entrepreneurship and technology and uh, in, certain, in, in public stuff. So when I, was in, um, when I was in college, a book like this, uh, Reinventing Government, uh, written, written by two, uh, two authors, Osborne and Gabler, like mm -hmm. set me a light. All of a sudden said to me, oh my gosh, you have this interest in public stuff. You like building things. You could spend a life doing, like, doing stuff at the intersection of the two. And yeah. it changed the course of my life. And I just hope maybe this book could do that for young people today. Mm -hmm. because we need them. We need them uh, in government. We need their skills. We need their inventiveness in government. If people, you know, if this book isn't for you, if people think about um, a young person in their life in college or in high school or in graduate school, who's wondering about how to, how to serve, but also how to build. I mean, I hope this will do that for those, uh, for those folks. So I very much hope the book will, 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 will make government better and people's lives better. And I hope part of that is inspiring a new kind of leadership and a new generation of leadership. Yeah. What have, you, what have your conversations been like uh, in your course, in the public entrepreneurship course? Because have you taught it three times now? Oh, no, now it's like six times or seven oh, times. times. So. Oh, so you yeah. have a, you've got a cohort of, um, of graduates. and, oh, and Hundreds. How? I mean, hundreds now. I mean, you know, Deb, when I started the course in 2015, I had no idea. I started it late. I came, to, you know, yeah. I wanted to get the course up and running. I was impatient. I wasn't, there were no students registered for it. Like it was after registration. So when we had the first day of the course, I had no idea, literally, whether anyone would show up in that classroom. Yeah. yeah. And then first there were 30. And now, of course, we pack our classrooms for this course. And it's been amazing. And they've gone off and started companies and led in government, um, run for office. Um, the, uh, uh, I will say that the conversation has shifted over time. So when we just started, when I just started the course, it was, this all felt new, public entrepreneurship, possibility of government. I hadn't even coined that uh, phrase yet, uh, but public entrepreneurship felt new. And in yeah. some ways the course was just alerting them. Now the students come in with so much experience, um, so much optimism, so much worry about this. We, yeah. have vi we have really vibrant conversations, so much hope for this, so much worry about what the technology companies might do or could do or government and skepticism. So, so it's, it's, uh, it's gotten harder to teach over time. The students um, um, are, are just brilliant. And uh, come in with as many uh, answers, questions, and um, so yeah. So we keep at it, but uh, it has definitely changed over time. It's interesting that you have built. Uh, and does the cohort stay in touch? Have you had any way to keep that conversation going amongst the? They stay in touch. Some with each other. Uh, we have um, we have a Facebook group. Uh, there's some uh, um, uh, you know chat groups. Uh, I had an event for them this spring. We had a mini reunion. Oh, right. uh, many of them came back for virtually, unfortunately, but uh, many of them came back to, to, to yeah. sort of hear about how the course had unfolded and hear about some of the new cases. So we stay in touch and I try to, I try to uh, learn from the things they're doing. And I, you know, I tell them always in the last day of class, as long as I'm here uh, um, at HBS, I'm, I'm here for you. So I, I love hearing from them. Yeah. yeah. There, there's another group, by the way, Deb, uh, of people who, um, 
who I, who I want to acknowledge the students, the students really helped make this book possible with all their participation and their questions. But there are also some amazing um, uh, folks in our case writing and research group at Harvard Business School who worked on so many of these cases. And um, our Singapore case, um, our Pittsburgh case, which I mentioned, our, uh, our uh, US Digital Service case, uh, so many other cases I didn't mention, uh, the SoftWorks case. And so I just have had amazing collaborators all along the way. And um, it's been so, so much fun working with them as well. Right. Well, I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you, because we did talk about it before, of uh, when we were time, trying to time the, the, um, the schedule for the, the date for this session, is that we were going to try to put it right around um, the Biden administration's 100 days. And you said, you know, it's too bad that they coined that term 100 days, and, and maybe what they should do is, is the stake should be around 100 ways as opposed to days. So I'm wondering, um, can you, in, in kind of as a last uh, wrap up is, uh, where do you think the 100 ways uh, sit with our, with our new administration? Well, I think it's fascinating that when the president um, uh, was elected, so victory night, November 7th, he gets up on that stage in Delaware, and he says there's one word we can use to describe America. And then he says that one word is possibilities, right? That's a lot to put on one word. And it's also this word here I've, yeah. I've been wrestling with for eight years in, in many ways. And, and he came up with it like that, right? Yeah. No, he's, been, he's, no, he, he's, he's been at he, it for a few more years than you, I think. Exactly. Yeah. So um, then he says it again on inauguration night, one word to define America possibilities. And he looks at his team and he says, you're my possibilities. And um, I find that really powerful. I, I think he means, um, you know, optimism and the future and hope. And I, I hope though, he also means something a little bit more particular, mm -hmm. which is that it's an uncertain future, that it's an uncertain future. I hope that when he says possibilities, he's also tapping into that, um, that, 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 that part of our history, which we've always known has been more experimental. George Washington in his first inaugural address, when he says, this is an experiment uh, staked in the hands of the American people. Abraham Lincoln um, in his second uh, inaugural, enshrined in the, in the Lincoln Memorial says, I can't hazard a prediction about the future. I hope that Biden was also tapping into that sense and giving his team some permission to try new things. And so I, I like to say we should pair the idea of 100 days. It was important that they spend 100 days just reestablishing competency um, in government. And it's also important that we invite a new 100 ways. How are we going to solve all the problems that face us? And we don't stop at the first or second idea that arrive on our list. And um, at all levels of government, all around the world, um, that's, I think, the mandate uh, that, uh, for the era we're living in. Yeah, fascinating. Well, you've, you've offered us so many ideas and inspirations about how what the possibilities uh, could be. And I think it comes at a time, uh, especially for all of us in Massachusetts, with um, Governor Baker um, declaring or rolling out new guidance um, that looks like we will have the end of the state of emergency um, and so many new uh, reopenings and gatherings, et cetera, can start taking place that we are at an incredible point of time for new possibilities. So I can't thank you enough, Mitch, for spending this time with us. We wish you all the best with this book. And I don't think there's anybody uh, who would disagree that there's there's many new ways to do things. So why don't we get out there and try them? So my thanks to you, my thanks to the team. Uh, again, as I mentioned at the beginning, when we were scurrying around thinking that, oh no, this might be our first books at Baker where we have to reschedule because of technical deal, uh, difficulties. And there's Matt Ripley uh, from our media services. Boy, we, we just couldn't live without you, Matt. So I wish you could un, um, un, um, or turn on your video so everybody can see you so that we can clap because there's Matt behind the scenes. He, he made it all work. Thank you very much. And Dina and Mariah, uh, Dina Gerdeman and um, Mariah Tumbleson Shaw from uh, Baker Library who make all of the books at Baker's uh, Sing. We have recorded this session. We'll be sending out a link. We, we make sure that the transcript uh, is uh, comprehensive and that um, because we want to make sure the accessibility, um, all of the access accessibility uh, formats are, are met. So you'll be seeing um, an email from us with the link. We invite you to have a look again and share it with your friends. And But of course, go out and get this book. I hope I've got it not blurred. Um, we the possibility, because it is a fascinating read. And 
maybe just maybe in the next edition, um, Mitch, you can put that picture of yourself as the voting <laughs> booth in the back and then everybody who's uh, on this call will say that's the possibility that we added is that we could, we could change the course of this book. So awesome. thank, thanks again uh, for joining us. Uh, our next session is going to be with um, Felix Op Op Ugh, Oberholzer G. And it's going to be, I've got this book right here. Um, better, simple, oops, strategy. So how to have a strategy simple that gets your possibility in line. So thanks again, everybody. Hope to see you at the next session. Bye for now. <laughs>